Welcome to the Gospel Attic Podcast. I'm Greg Bryan. And I'm Jim Resty. We're gospel addicts because we believe the gospel of Jesus isn't just good news, it's the best news ever. We're addicted to the gospel because it doesn't just start us out in the Christian life, it is the Christian life. Join us as we look at the Bible through the lens of the gospel. Thanks so much for listening. Welcome to another episode of the Gospel Attic Podcast. I'm Greg Bryan. I am joined with Tom Rudelius, who is a new author of a book called Chasing Proof, Finding Faith, A Young Scientist's Search for Truth in a World of Uncertainty. Tom, I'm so excited to have you on the show. How are you doing tonight? Uh, good. Yeah, excited to be here. Thanks. Great. Well, hey, before we dive in, and, and there's so much interesting stuff that that your book covers, and I want to get to as much of it as I can. Just uh, tell our audience a little bit about yourself, like a little bit about your background. Okay, yeah. So um, I'm a postdoctoral researcher in theoretical physics at the University of California, Berkeley right now. Uh, so I do research in string theory, cosmology, and quantum field theory. And starting this fall, I'll be a professor of physics at Durham University in the United Kingdom. Uh, yeah. Do you want to hear a little, any more, uh, anything else? Well, that's exciting. That's exciting. Congratulations on the, on the job. How are you feeling about Thanks. moving, moving, uh, to a different country? It's a little overwhelming, but I'm excited about it. Awesome. I know your educational background, you, you, you've been, you did your undergrad at Cornell, a doctorate at Harvard. Um, and then you did, what did you do at Princeton? Yeah, I was a postdoc. I did my first postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And then I'm finishing on my second postdoc now here at Berkeley. Okay. And obviously your field is science. And, so you know, many people think science and faith are incompatible. So let's just dive into, you know, yeah. get as much good content as we can. Uh, how did your faith journey teach you otherwise? Yeah, um, well... I guess I think, you know, when people talk about incompatibility between science and, and faith um, and that perception, I, I think, first of all, that there are some very legitimate questions. And there were some legitimate questions that I had along my own journey of, of you know, how am I, I as a modern thinking person who believes in science supposed to believe in miracles? And what am I supposed to do with the opening chapters of Genesis and these sorts of questions that I, I had to wrestle with? Um, but I think there's sort of maybe maybe a broader um, cultural view of, of science and faith, which is that science and religion are just two totally distinct and incompatible approaches to the same questions. And in this view, science is like, you know, science deals with facts, you know, data, hard truths, uh, and religion is like mindless conformity, uh, just believe because that's what the pastor and priest told you to, to believe, to do, right? Don't ask questions. And, and when you put that on a scale, I mean, I'm going to pick science every time. I think just about everyone is, but, but something that I've really learned in my journey of both being a scientist and also my journey of becoming a person of faith is, is that I think that, uh, that that view is very misguided. I think that ultimately science and religion aren't two totally incompatible approaches to the same question. I think they're really actually rather similar approaches to very different questions where I think science does a better job at dealing with questions about mechanisms, how the world works and how it's come to be. And religion does a better job at dealing qu with questions of meaning of, of why are we here? What's our meaning and purpose in this life? And I think something that I've really experienced as a scientist, you know, there's this view that science just gives us like perfect, complete knowledge and, uh, that it gives us these, you know, these hard facts. But I've gone to a lot of conferences and uh, I hear a lot of physicists arguing and disagreeing with one another um, because the reality is that in science too, there's there's plenty of uncertainty. Uh, you know, there's there's a reason why every scientific experiment has error bars. And a lot of times there's there's more uncertainty than we'd like, which is why you have communities that get divided within the within the scientific world. There are, you know, some physicists will argue this position and some argue this other position. And I think the same is true with faith that, yes, there's uncertainty. Um, you know, I'm not as certain in the existence of God as I am in the existence of, say, gravity. 
Um, but nonetheless, I think that the arguments for God really are compelling. And I think some of the arguments against the existence of God uh, also carry weight. And so I think that ultimately what I found, and actually, you know, going from just an outsider and my my perspective of religion is just mindless conformity. What, what I found is that I didn't have to shut off my brain in, in order to believe that I could approach faith with the same sort of approach that I that I took to science of trying to navigate this world of uncertainty, trying to uh, figure out what was the most reasonable position and uh, what was the most practical position. Um, and so for me, yeah, I found that science and faith are, are actually similar approaches. I approach them similarly. It's just I think to me, it's very different questions. I like that. So people might be interested. Why did you choose string theory as a, as your field of study? And what is string theory for those who may not know? Okay, yeah. Um, so I'll start with the second question. So st string theory is a somewhat controversial um, field of physics, of theoretical physics, that attempts to reconcile quantum mechanics with Einstein's theory of gravity called general relativity. So, so both quantum mechanics and general relativity work incredibly well in their own regimes of their own domains of validity, say. But if you try to put them together in this into an overlapping domain of validity, what, what you find is that they, they don't combine in any simple fashion. And this is really string theory's claim to fame is, is that it's the one consistent approach that we, we know of at this moment to combining quantum mechanics with gravity into a theory of what's called quantum gravity. Uh, now, the reason why it's controversial is that string theory is um, it, the, the, the energies that would be required to test it are well beyond anything that we can achieve technologically. Um, so even our even our most powerful particle accelerators, the, the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, it does it just doesn't get us anywhere near clo anywhere close to the energies that we need to get to to test string theory experimentally. And so. Most of our evidence for string theory comes from mathematical calculations rather than experimental data. And so uh, some people, you know, some people would say, well, is string theory, even science, at the least, I think one should say that that string theory isn't going to have the same amount of certainty that we see uh, in in other in, say, in other places in particle physics. So it's a controversial field. I think um, what drew me to it is is in part practical. Uh, that I'm a lot better at math than I am at actually doing any sort of physics experiments. So of the areas of physics, this I was sort of uh, naturally drawn to this. I think the other thing that is exciting about it, string theory to me is that it really is is asking the big questions. You know that there there are a lot of interesting questions out there that academics could work on. Um, but to me, the question of of what is the fundamental laws of nature? What can that tell us about reality? That, that to me is an is a question that's interesting enough that it's worth pursuing, even if it's a little bit speculative at times, even if, uh, you know, we don't have the experimental data that we'd like. That's, that's good. Uh, before I want to get into your, your journey, your spiritual mm -hmm. journey and hear, hear about mm -hmm. that. But before I do just a little bit back, to, going back to just the, the idea of being a scientist, you know, I think a lot of people have this perception that all scientists are atheists, mm -hmm. um, but that's not true, is it? Uh, no, it's it's not. <laughs> As an example, yeah, yeah, but many, but many, but many are, and many are. Yeah, one thing that I've heard is the ones that are that tend to uh, not be atheists are the ones that work on the smallest of particles, and the mm -hmm. ones that work on the biggest things in the universe, the, the, you know, and that makes sense to me that, um, you know, if you, if you're mm -hmm. studying the universe, how can you, how can you not think that there is a designer behind that universe? And then if you're going to the smallest and smallest of particles, that, that makes sense too. Does that, is that, is, is that true? Or I, I heard that recently that the scientists who are, who tend to be believing in God are the ones yeah. who tend to work on those two extremes. Yeah, well, personally, I work on both of those two extremes. So um, I guess I'm a data point in, in favor of that hypothesis. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that my, my, in my own experience, there there does seem to be uh, more religious faith among people in my field in within physics 
than in say a lot of the softer sciences um, uh, like anthropology and psychology and things like this. Um, I don't know why exactly sociologically that seems to be the case, um, but but it's true that, I mean, I'm, I'm a religious physicist. Um, I know a number of other religious physicists and I also know a lot of physicists who maybe aren't religious, but um, are, are sort of sympathetic to the enterprise that maybe they don't believe in God but they don't think that it's, uh, you know, totally um, impossible or, or unreasonable to think that there could be a God. Okay. Um, well, let's talk about like, how did your family and friends impact your journey to faith? I know you have a, you have a twin brother, I believe. And uh, at one point he became a uh, follower of Jesus. Yeah. Um, talk, talk about that. How did that affect you? And, and tell us about your journey. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I guess, so my, I'll, yeah, I'll talk, I'll talk, uh, I guess about it, my brother. So I have a twin brother named Steve and, um, we've growing up, we were always best friends. Uh, we still are. And, um, we were raised in a very non-religious family. So we never went to church, never read the Bible or the Quran or anything like that. Uh, most of what I knew about religion honestly came from cartoons and, um, and growing up, I would say I was pretty, I was pretty indifferent. I was pretty apathetic towards religion in general. And I think my brother, my twin brother, Steve was too, but he, of the two of us, he was probably a little bit more um, opposed to religion. He he would, I'd say, you know, ma ma occasionally make jokes about religion or something uh, more than I would. So, um, so I was really surprised when one day our freshman year of college, I went to Cornell, he went to Northwestern. Uh, and one day he told me he decided to become a Christian. And as I say, that was very surprising to me. Um, it was something I, I definitely, you know, of, of the two of us, I never would have expected that he would be the one uh, to turn to faith. And um, he had come, I guess he got involved in, uh, in a church there. He'd been brought in by a guy on his floor who was a student, uh, a Christian at, at Northwestern. And, um, and when Steve and I, so when, you know, when he started talking with me, he told told me about how he'd become a Christian. He started, uh, you know, trying to share his faith with me and asking me what I th thought about, about the existence of God and Jesus and all these things. And my first reaction was, um, was kind of one, one of fear. Um, I, w I wasn't very happy about it. I think in part, I was just afraid of losing him. Like he, like, uh, you know, he'd been my best friend and I was afraid that this was going to really change him and it was going to change our relationship. And I was also, I guess the, the impression I had of religion, as I say, was kind of like mindless conformity. And, and the impression I had of religious people was that they're just very judgmental. Um, so I think in one of our first conversations, I, I just told, I literally told Steve, you know, Steve, I think I'm a pretty moral person and I don't want you judging me. Like I thought that that's what religion was. And I thought that's what, what religion was to him. And I think from those early con conversations with him, something I, re I realized pretty quickly is that for him, religion wasn't just like a, a list of do's and don'ts. Like you, you have to do these things and then you get to go to heaven. And if you don't do these things, then you don't. And you can look down on your look down your nose on anyone who isn't doing those things. Right. Um, I, I realized pretty quickly that to Steve, the thing that had brought him there was was actually thinking about death and, and life after death. And, you know, am I just going to cease to exist? And um, and so for him, that that, you know, it was those questions, which I, I think are in some ways bigger questions. Um, than just, you know, what, what, are, you know, give me a list of things to do or not do. And so, so that was really what had brought him there. And, and it also became clear talking to him that um, although he had come across these, these newfound convictions and, and that he believed them very strongly, you know, and passionately, that that didn't change his love for me. Uh, and, and so that was something that I think was really, help, was really encouraging as we started talking more and I started, uh, you know, exploring the faith guided by him, um, that I never once, uh, questioned the, his love for me, e even in all of it. So, um, you talked about having preconceptions about Christianity. Um, did you, uh, did you, are there some that you haven't mentioned yet? Like you mentioned, you know, Christians are judgmental or any, any other uh, ones come to mind? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Here, another one, I guess that, and that kind of leads me into the next, the next chapter of, of the, the story is, uh, 
I guess I had, I, you know, I had a number of friends whose parents made them go to church every, every week growing up. And the impression I got from them was always uh, that religion is very boring and, and the, you know, the Bible is very boring. Um, so when Steve tried to give me a copy of the Bible, a new, uh, the New Testament more specifically to read for the first time, I, I told him, look, Steve, I have trouble finding time to read books that I want to read much less time to read books that I don't want to read. Um, that was just where it, it seemed like it wasn't, you know, it didn't, it seemed boring. It seemed like it wasn't something that was that important to me. And uh, there were just other things that I would rather be doing to, to spend my time. And so when I started, eventually I did start reading the, the new Testament and, and that was really a, a preconception that I had a misconception that I had that, um, that was changed pretty quickly as I started to just read the gospel of Matthew I didn't find it boring at all. I actually found Jesus to be very compelling, a very captivating figure. And um, uh, yeah, so that was that was maybe the next the next big misconception that I had that started to change. Yeah. So what what um, what was it that got you to start reading the, the New Testament? Because I know there's, you know, lots of people get handed Bibles and and uh, they sit there. Do, do you remember the circumstances that was it just you were bored? one night and you were just like, ah, eh, why not? Yeah. You know, uh, what, what, it, here's what, what I can remember clearly. I mean, all of it, definitely the, the reason why I started reading the new Testament, the reason why I started um, reading some other books of, about the debate, you know, Christianity or an atheism, uh, a book called letters from, from a skeptic by Gregory and, and Edward Boyd was, was a, really important for me. Um, all, all of this was, be, was guided by Steve. Like he was talking to me, he was asking me what I believed and part of it was wanting to explore what he, um, what, you know, this, this faith that he had, had stumbled upon and trying to understand why he had decided to become a Christian. Part of it was that I didn't want to be left behind, you know, if that was something that was important to him. Um, I wanted to, you know, at least give it a shot. And and there, there was one day specifically that I remember that was my first Bible study where um, I asked Steve in, you know, sometime in the morning, like, hey, what do you want to do today? Uh, it was like over, it was over the summer after our freshman year of college. So I asked him, hey, what do you want to do? And he said, let's do a Bible study. And I said, that sounds boring. Can, can we do something else? And I think we went, we threw a baseball or something. But I, I spent the next few hours just thinking about all the times growing up when he did things for me that that he didn't really want to do uh, just to make me happy. And I thought, OK, you know what? If like this is going to make him happy, like I should do this, this thing for him this one time. And so that afternoon, I was like, hey, do you, do you still want to do a Bible study? And we sat down and we read the first chapter of the Gospel of John together. So I think that that was, that was one example. But I think that, that was kind of really the story of the whole, um, the whole journey was that it, it was really because of Steve being there and his, by his encouragement that, you know, I, he sort of wore me down. I was like, OK, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll try reading the Bible. OK, I'll try going to church with you. Yeah, that's awesome. He, he persevered with you. And he uh, did, yeah. yeah, I'm curious about Steve. Did is Steve in the same field of study as you, or did he choose a different field? That, that's funny, actually. No, Steve's uh, Steve works now in ministry, um, in campus ministry at, at Northwestern. So he he graduated from there, and he uh, stayed just stayed involved in in ministry there ever since. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So, would you have considered yourself an agnostic before you? trusted christ yeah the i think i really I, I was more apathetic than anything else i hadn't thought much about it it didn't seem that important to me but when S steve kind of started you know asking me like hey what do you believe that about all this stuff i what i realized is you know i think i am an agnostic i'm not sure if god exists maybe he does doesn't seem that important to me yeah. so um just you know from a scientific perspective you know how do you describe the role of morals in an agnostic's life yeah um i mean i think like it, you know as, as far as like how i was raised how i how i grew up mor morals played a very important role you know i was um and, and that's something in, in my book that i i try to convey in the first couple chapters of, of my young life is that I never felt like I was short on, on good moral teachers. Like I think, I think my parents did a really great job 
of, of teaching me what was right and what was wrong. And I'm really thankful for them and for, for my teachers, for, for, you know, just for, for the education that I got. Um, but, you know, what I, um, so yeah, so for, for a while I thought, you know, well, I'm already a moral person. I don't need religion because that, to me, that's what, you know, re religion was just there to, to, to like give you a specific list of rules to do and a specific list of rules not to do. And I figured I don't really need that. Um, but, but something that I, I started to realize as I started researching more and I started looking into this, uh, the whole debate, God's existence is, um, I felt like there were, you know, there, there was kind of the, the missing underpinning of, of why certain things are moral and certain things are immoral. Um, and I, I remember specifically one time in, uh, in high school where we were the, somehow the discussion in the class was about the make a wish foundation uh which is an, an organization which which tries to you know help um ter uh children with term ter terminal illnesses right. to, to live some sort of yeah so live out some dream of theirs yeah it's um, a great great organization right it, yeah and it's a it's a great thing and um and a student in my in the class said um what's what's the point they're all going to die anyway and uh i like a lot of the other students in the class were like how how could you say such a thing what a terrible thing to say um but what i realized is that is that none of us actually gave an argument as to why that isn't right you know um from from a purely scientific perspective i guess i, I look out at the world as a cosmologist you know i'm i i think of things on time scales of like billions of years. And, and from that perspective, humans have been around for just a, a fraction of a second, and we're going to die out in a fraction of a second. And from that perspective, it really raises the question of, you know, not just for the, for the kids, but for all of us, like what, what's the point? We're all just going to die anyway. Is there any sort of deeper meaning and purpose to anything that we're doing? Um, and once I started asking those questions, I started to realize that, that my, previous worldview just wasn't sufficient that it might, it was sufficient to, you know, tell me, do this, don't do that. And, and, and looking back, I think that all of those lessons were good, but what was kind of missing is, is why, what's, what, what's the meaning of all of this and why, why am I, why should we be following these rules in the first place? Okay. So in your book, you tell a story about taking a polygraph test because um, mm -hmm. you were doing an internship at the NSA, I believe. And I have no idea if this ties in here, but uh -huh. apparently it had a big impact on you. Tell us the story and and how yeah. it impacted your faith. Yeah. So, um, so the polygraph came. My first polygraph, actually, I had several. First polygraph came um, uh, about nine months into my search for God. We'll say um, after, or was it maybe a little bit less than that? Maybe between six six to my, nine months after, you know. I started talking with Steve. I started reading the Bible. Um, and I was at a place going into to my first polygraph um, where my, my approach to, to religion was still, um, you know, I, I, it was seeming more plausible. I'd, I'd been reading books. I read books arguing for the existence of God. I'd read The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins arguing against the existence of God. I'd, I'd finished the New Testament. And uh, it was all actually... I, sounding pretty plausible. Like Christianity really seemed like it was onto something. Um, and yet I still was at this place where it just felt like a, such a big step to, to just change my worldview, to, to um, make the leap of faith. And it just feel, felt like something that I, that I didn't really need to do, or um, just didn't seem like something that was, that was worth it for me. I was still just focused, more focused on other things in my life. And going into this polygraph test, I was trying to get a security clearance to work a summer internship with the NSA. And my approach to the polygraph, I think was pretty similar to my approach towards heaven, which is, hey, I'm basically a good person. If there's a heaven, I'll probably go to it. Uh, I'm basically a good person. You know, this polygraph isn't, isn't gonna be a problem for me. And so I went in and I started answering the questions and I realized pretty quickly that I was going to, um, to fail this test, not only if I were lying, but just if I felt guilty about anything. Because even, even if I felt guilty about something, that would make me, start sweating and, and start breathing harder, you know, um, and that would be enough to, to indicate deception on the test. 
So I just, uh, I did what, what, what you basically have to do to try to pass a polygraph, which is just start confessing and, and talk about all the things. I talked about all the things I'd done, the things that I was embarrassed to talk about, uh, the things I'd planned to never tell anyone. Um, it, it really was just like, you know, a good old Catholic confessional. And um, what I realized in that, uh, you know, after, after doing that for, for hours, actually, um, I, I started to really see this and understand this message um, that I'd been reading about, that Steve had been teaching me about uh, how all people are, are broken and, and sinful and uh, in need of God. And previously, you know, I, I'd had arguments with Steve. I think most people, people are generally good. And all of a sudden, you know, I realized, man, you know, deep down, I'm not such a good person after all. I've done a lot of things I'm not proud of. And it was at that moment that, that the gospel kind of clicked for me, that uh, that when I realized that I, I too was in need of a savior, that the whole message of a God who, who died to give me that forgiveness um, made sense out of my own experience and made sense out of the world around me. And it was the moment where I started to, to believe in Christianity, not just sort of in a hypothetical, I think this is more likely true, but in a very personal way. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Gospel Addict Podcast. Feel free to contact us via email at gospeladdictpodcast at gmail.com. Stay tuned for our next episode. And remember, on your worst days, you're never beyond the reach of God's grace. And on your best days, you're never beyond the need of God's grace. See you next time.